Welcome to the PCOS Diva podcast. My name is Amy Medling. I'm a certified health coach and founder of PCOS Diva. My mission is to help women with PCOS find the tools and knowledge they need to take control of their PCOS so they can regain their fertility, femininity, health, and happiness. Today's PCOS Diva podcast is sponsored by the seven-day Discover Your PCOS Diva Jumpstart program. Jumpstart is the place to begin when you're ready to commit to yourself and jump into your healing journey. Learn step-by-step how diet, lifestyle, and mindset changes can get you on the right path. You'll be thrilled to feel your energy return, brain fog lift, acne begin to clear, and so much more. Visit PCOSDiva.com slash jumpstart for more information and to get started today. If you haven't already, make sure you check out PCOSDiva.com. There I offer tons of great free information about PCOS and how to develop your PCOS diet and lifestyle plan so you can begin to thrive like a PCOS diva. Look for me on iTunes, Facebook, Pinterest, and Instagram as well. Today we're talking to Dr. Farah Duro. She practices reproductive acupuncture at Florida Complete Wellness in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And after overcoming her own struggles with PCOS and endometriosis, using a combination of traditional Chinese medicine and other natural methods, she has felt a tremendous joy in sharing her methods with other women, and she founded the PCOS Revolution Academy. I discovered uh, Dr. Farah through her really great podcast, The PCOS Revolution, which I was uh, honored to be a guest on recently, and I'm really honored to have her uh, uh, to reciprocate and have her on the PCOS Diva podcast. So welcome, Dr. Farah. Thank you so much for having me. I'm honored. So I think uh, you have some interesting perspective because you um, are an acupuncturist, and I think I know for me, acupuncture was sort of one of my last resort therapies when I was really feeling crappy with PCOS. I had tried so many different um, uh, pharmaceuticals and trying to eat different ways and uh, went to acupuncture and saw a real difference, especially in, uh, I think probably it really regulated my cortisol levels and and helped me with my adrenals. and I have a feeling that you see women sort of at like, well, in all different areas of their PCOS journey, but certainly when they're frustrated and kind of have lost all hope. And I would love for you to share, we had kind of just talked about this, about the mistakes that you see women make in their PCOS journey. And I think you could really shed some light on that for us. Yeah, we are the last house on the block, We're <laughs> acupuncture speaking. So a lot of people will come to an acupuncture treatment because they've tried so many other things that have just not been working for them. So year after year, when I would notice the pattern of a lot of times that women would go through, um, I just, it broke my heart a lot of times to see the suffering that's been going on. Um, so I decided to really hone in on some key areas that could be avoided if we actually made women aware of them. And I put together a list of, of you know, some very important points that I think um, should be shared. And I really think this is such important work that you're doing um, to just get the message out there that um, there's so many options. It's not just, you know, uh, birth control and that's it, sort of quick fix. There are multifaceted treatments for PCOS and acupuncture is one of them. And it's, you know, of course, thousands of years old. Um, acupuncture has been used for infertility and you know, women's health issues since the Song Dynasty. So going back 700 AD or so, you, you have texts that are actually written on TCM or Chinese medicine gynecology. So it's evolved over, you know, centuries and to what we have now. And I think that it's eye-opening to really look at all the different um, success stories that, you know, that you've gone through and other women who have PCOS and who've overcome it, and myself included. So, yeah, I'm happy to share those. (laughs) So uh, just curious, was your PCOS journey, was that sort of... um 
inspired you to to become a Chinese medicine practitioner? Yeah, actually, I started out pre-med. So I was at, um, I went to school, and you know, at 17, I decided I have eight doctors in my family, and I just always thought I'm going into medicine. And uh, and I went, and a couple years into it, I decided um, to do a research project on acupuncture and drug addiction, actually, uh, for a psychology course. And I was fascinated. Uh, and actually, this is a long time ago. It was before Google. So I was in the medical library just reading all I could. There were about 20 books on acupuncture. And I was fascinated with it. And I said, I don't know what this is, but um, this is pretty incredible if this does what this says this does. So I wrote my paper, got an A, <laughs> and I really was um, just fascinated with it. And I couldn't get it out of my mind because I loved working with plants and herbs as a child, um, I was very into herbs and making my own tinctures for acne and all that stuff. Uh, so I decided I want to go to school for this. I've never had it. In Alabama, we don't have a lot of acupuncture even now. So I'd never even experienced a treatment. And I left uh, pre-med school, much to my family's dismay. I said, I'm, I'm going to acupuncture school, guys. <laughs> so I moved to Florida and I started school uh, and I just fell in love with it. And my symptoms cleared up because basically when I was in pre-med, I had gone to several gynecologists since my cycles were horrendous. When I would have them, maybe it was like two to three months sometimes apart, they would be so painful it was debilitating. And, you know, it was not, nothing really that I could do. I just assume, well, maybe this is how most people feel. I, I really didn't know that it was that unusual, honestly. So, um, so I go to the gynecologist and they said, well, look, just take birth control. So I did try that. And I became violently ill with birth control. Like my body just totally rejected it. And um, about the fourth time I went to a different gynecologist, he actually threw the birth control pills at my head. <laughs> he said, here, take this. And if you, if you don't take it, don't bother coming back. And I, at that point, I just broke down. I was like, I can't go through this anymore. So, and I know I can't be the only one going through this. So um, that's my whole, I guess, my, my pivot when I decided to go to Chinese medicine school. I said, I can't, um, I, I really can't see myself going through this for the rest of my life. So I, so yeah, I, I was amazed when I started getting treatments. I'm like, oh my God, this is how I'm supposed to feel. Like, that's crazy. <laughs> so, so that, and then I decided I really wanted to do this uh, to help other women actually know what this feels like and, you know, that you can have normal cycles. You can feel better emotionally. You don't have to suffer with pain. And um, within about six months, my cycles normalized. Um, you know, and I went to China, I discovered a Chinese herbal formula that was right for me. And that subsequently helped me have my children. So, <laughs> so that that's what I, I really wanted to um, focus on for the rest of my life, pretty much. Oh, what a great story. And thank you so much for the work that you do. It's, um, I know that it, it's helping so many women. Um, you know, I, I really see a parallel in our, our journeys, I, especially around the pill being sort of the pivot point because like you, I couldn't tolerate it. And so sort of le it led me on my journey as well. Um, and, and to find, um, you know, PCOS diva, but I'm, I'm thinking that that might be one of the mistakes on your list that, you know, women putting hope into some type of magic pill to help their PCOS. Yes, it, it is number two on my list. It probably should be number one because um, what women are not told is that taking birth control over time can lead to increased insulin resistance, which, you know, if you have a history of diabetes in your family or, you, you know, do have PCOS, you're at a bigger risk, obviously, of insulin resistance. And in, unless you're given another drug to help with that, it, uh, you have weight gain and all kinds of stuff going on. Um, even though your acne might clear up, maybe temporarily, it's still not addressing the underlying causes. So in my case, I knew that wasn't a long-term solution. And uh, a lot of women who come in uh, don't want to be on the birth control pill. They say, look, if there's another option, I'll take it. I, I read this study, 90% of women who have PCOS um, would rather have another option other than birth control for their symptoms. So that says, that says volumes right there. So I really think that um, there's nothing wrong if you're using that for, you know, conception care, that sort of thing. But if you are using it to take control of your PCOS symptoms, um, we had someone come in this week who was on it 30 years, and she's 45 now and trying to come off 
birth control and she's terrified and it becomes a crutch. I think after a while, you know, how, how much is it really helping us? Um, so that, that's something to consider. Wow. 30 years is a long time. Mm -hmm. Even her doctor saying it's time to come off, <laughs> you know, but it could be scary. It, it could be terrifying. If you've been on it for that long, what is your body going to look like? What are your symptoms going to be? Um, but I'll say we've helped so many women come off of it and definitely you, you don't have to be afraid. It's not going to be as bad as you think nine times out of 10. Yeah, and, uh, are you familiar with Dr. Jolene Brighton? She's done a lot of work around um, helping women kind of detox and come off the pills. She just wrote a book called Beyond the Pill. That um, I think I've heard of that, yes. Mm -hmm. So if, if women that are listening, that, that's a good resource if you're thinking about coming off the pill. Um, so, so tell us about some of the other um, kind of uh, ways that women with PCOS can, can improve upon to get better care. So one of the top mistakes that we see um, are basically not asking enough questions to their doctor. So if you are going into your appointment and you are going in for the first time to a new gynecologist and your period is irregular um, and you're, you know, given the standard care, which is basically just basic blood work, sometimes uh, you don't really get a whole deep hormone panel or nutrient panel and that sort of thing, depending on where you're going. Uh, and you kind of leave with birth control, and there's really not much else. They might not even tell you that you have PCOS, and that has been what we've seen. A lot of times with women, we've actually had women go through infertility treatment never being told they have PCOS. So that blew my mind when that was happening, and I think that some providers don't really think it's as important. They think, um, well, it's just going to be fixed with medication, and then that's all you really have to do. Um, which we know that's not the case. And so I think that asking questions like, what did my labs tell you? And uh, can I have a copy of my labs so that I could share it with other providers, perhaps like your acupuncturist or um, your functional medicine doctor or your counselors, your nutritionist. Um, they need to see that too. So remember that everything you do is part of you. Like you own that blood work. So you have a right to get a copy of that any ultrasounds you have done, definitely get a copy of that. And then ask them, what types of treatment could I try before taking medication? Because nine times out of 10, there's other options, but that's just not on the table if you have a five minute appointment. So you, you, know, you have to be the squeaky wheel and ask these questions. And then finally ask, how long should I wait to retake my labs before I find out how well this treatment is working? Even if you're going to a naturopath, you know, you're getting, you're taking supplements. How long are you going to wait to find out if those supplements are working? Maybe you need to tweak something. You know, PCOS is definitely not straightforward a lot of times. So, you know, with our patients, we need to repeat blood work if we find something's abnormal. What about the thyroid and all those things? So we have a list of tests, and I know you have a list of tests that you would love to have women get done. And I think that's important because for PCOS, not every practitioner is going to be familiar with what type of blood work you need to have. So if you are going to someone who is a specialist in PCOS, that's a different story. But if, if you're going to your provider who's not as familiar, you probably need to do a little bit more research before going into that appointment and then leave there with, you know, at least a list of questions that you've had some answers to for sure. Yeah, that's excellent advice. I, I like to keep a three ring binder and mm -hmm. put my lab results in there. And then you can see, um, you know, how, as you, as you mentioned, how supplements can affect your labs, you know, over time, if you sort of, uh, you know, keep a running record of them. I know I've, I saw my testosterone levels improve dramatically um, as a result of lifestyle change. And but you can't do that if you're not requesting your labs. And I think that's such an important part of managing your care. Definitely. And it's okay to have that conversation. You know, if your provider is on the other side saying, I'm not willing to order those for you. Um, I don't really, you know, have any answers to your questions. Then it's time to seek another opinion. And there's nothing wrong with that. It might take you a few providers to find the right one. And that's okay. Right. And so it's, it's really being comfortable with who 
you're going to and also taking that initiative to I like you know keeping the journal and keeping track of your labs yourself for sure. Do you think that doctors just don't know how to diagnose PCOS or um, do you think that they're they're missing women that don't have that classic form they're sort of just uh, diagnosing by sight I guess um, so that yeah, definitely. It's it's not, and a lot of times that since the new criteria came out, I mean, it seemed like it would be more straightforward, but there's still some debate sometimes among different practitioners about who has PCOS. So um, some practitioners think you still have to see it on an ultrasound, and we know that's not true. So um, there's definitely different presentations too, as a lot of women who are older. Um, actually, I you know worked uh, with an IVF clinic in the past who they basically said, well, if you are approaching, you know, menopause or if you're done having kids, there's really no reason to diagnose PCOS, which we know is, wow, I was really shocked to hear that because definitely we have to focus on other things. We're not just focused on fertility with PCOS. There's so many other cardiovascular and diabetes risks that go up, uh, you know, especially when you get into your late 40s and 50s, early 50s. So, um, we, and teenagers, it's going to look different. So, yeah, there needs to be more education around the presentation of PCOS as you get older or also when, you know, as you, as you get into your teenage years. So we have, uh, you know, asking the right questions at the doctor's office, um, looking at uh, solutions outside of the birth control. Um, you know, don't just take that as... Uh, you know, the only thing that's, that's available to you for managing PCOS. So what are some other um, common mistakes that you're seeing that women make? Well, I mean, I think that, um, you know, I, I, we always emphasize uh, number three is blaming yourself on our little list because if you are diagnosed with PCOS, sometimes the immediate response is like, I did something to cause this. And having PCOS is definitely not your fault there is nothing that you did to cause, you know, your PCOS symptoms. And in my experience, um, definitely there's a really strong genetic link. And you have probably had PCOS since you were born. <laughs> and things just happened uh, to actually bring that the symptoms out a lot of times um, and exacerbate them. So um, we know that there's no way you can just wave a magic wand and say, okay, you're, you know, you're cured. But over time, there's definitely ways to reverse the symptoms, and we know that uh, personally with our practice for the last 20 years, we've seen it time and time again, and sometimes, you know, that just knowing that the, you are empowered now because you know what's wrong with you, I think that's really powerful to um, take that blame away, um, and, you know, sometimes we have uh, patients where they have three generations of PCOS, and so they know already, okay, well, yeah, my mom did have it. But you know what? They probably dealt with it in other ways, and they, they got pregnant with you, and they were able to, you know, make their own changes. So, so definitely we've created our own paths, but there's no room for blame there at all, you know. That, that's such a good point, and I think that um, women with PCOS feel kind of at, at the core that they're not enough, that, you know, but struggling with fertility, um, struggling with these symptoms that make you feel less feminine. You know, mm -hmm. I think they, they, they feel, and I know I felt this way, felt really less than, and, and that it was something that I did, that it was my fault in some way. Um, but, you know, I think I just did an interview podcast with Dr. Felice Gersh. She has a new book out called PCOS SOS. And, um, she, she frames it in a really great way. She talks about how um, PCOS is a, a um, syndrome that actually benefited kind of the ancient woman. You know, mm -hmm. we, we had, um, it, it was really almost a survival mechanism, but because now we're not living in that kind of hunter-gatherer um, era that that the, the modern era is tough on our PCOS genes. And we kind of just have to, uh, you know, kind of go back to some of the, um, the ways that we, that were beneficial to, of living that were beneficial to our PCOS genes in terms of, of diet and, you know, not eating as many 
processed foods and um so it's 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 a the way that she frames it i think is really a healthy way that it's just we need to learn to um kind of live with our genes in this modern world um in a more productive way definitely we uh, according to you know one an, an endocrinologist i interviewed a while back he said we're the perfect woman <laughs> because <laughs> evolutionary wise i probably we were the warriors you know we were like getting stuff done and <laughs> you know and and then over time yeah our, our whole, I, we were never meant to sit at a computer all day i really don't think our bodies were ever designed that way you know um and and you have so much readily available processed foods too it, it's hard so um, the, the book I'm reading now, um, I know he didn't ask me about a book, but I, I want to bring up the slight edge. I don't know if you've read it, but it tells you about the little changes that you make throughout your day and how those little changes add up to bigger changes throughout the months and then really much bigger changes throughout the year. And whenever um, I start anything like an exercise program or anything like that, at first we want to see immediate results. And then, you know, we can blame ourselves when we don't see those results. And I know I've become very impatient sometimes with myself. Like, how come I'm not, you know, at the weight that I want to be, or I'm not doing this, that sort of thing, and it's not um, evident immediately. And I think um, blaming yourself can actually slow you down. And it can also derail you. So, um, so then this book, it actually goes through the little changes that add up to over time. And I think taking a long-term approach to PCOS and saying, I'm not there this month, I'm not at the weight I want to be, or my skin doesn't look the way it wants, I, I want it to be um, today, but three months from now, or a year from now even, imagine how I will feel and how I will look if I keep doing what I'm doing and you know, start to really implement these little changes. So, you know. That, that's such a great approach. Can you tell us the name of the book again? Sure. It's called The Slight Edge by Jeff Olson. And it's one of these books that you just want to kind of refer to, like, from time to time again. You can read it, like, three or four times probably. It's still really good. And um, I, I don't know. I just feel a lot of inspiration every time I read it um, because it can help you in those times where you're beating yourself up. So... So you are enough, and PCOS is not your fault. Um, what else are you seeing in your practice? Well, when we talk about, um, just as we're speaking about diets, uh, it can really be an issue, too, because a lot of our patients um, would like to lose weight quickly sometimes, and they are seeing a lot of fad diets that are offering quick results or promising quick results. And what I tell them is, um, I want you to visualize something you can see yourself doing when you're 80. And if you can see yourself doing keto, or you can see yourself doing other things uh, until you're 80, then that's right for you. That's great. You know, if that's something that, um, that you can really see doing long term. I don't think that um, a lot of the, you know, billions of diets that are out there, they're really, the whole purpose sometimes is to, um, market to sell a book or to sell a program and that sort of thing. And, and that's um, something that I think is, is really unfortunate because they set you up for failure, most of them, I think. Um, we see it time and time again. And I think that it's just being, um, some, you know, really, really cluing into what your body needs and making sure that you have enough nutrients. That's when we do nutrient testing. After someone's come off of these sites, we can see that they are depleted in a lot of key nutrients that are just not part of what they were doing. So, so yeah, I mean, it, it, it is challenging, but uh, it has to be sustainable. And so following a diet plan that fails is really one of the, the bigger things that we see with patients who are um, coming in for weight loss with PCOS or, you know, that sort of thing. And, and so we try to get off the diet mindset and, and actually end up increasing the amount of food that they're eating. So... Yeah, I remember several years ago, it seems like a lot of women with PCOS were doing the HCG diet. It was like mm -hmm. 500 calories a day, and it really messed with their hormones um, and caused a lot of problems, I think, with the appetite hormones. Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. So I, I love that that idea of, of sustainability, and um, I think that's a great question. Can you see yourself doing this at 80? 
that's that's a great right yeah it, and um i hope that we're all eating awesome healthy whole foods when we're 80 you know <laughs> we're all blessed to be doing that and not having to follow any any crash diets or nothing wrong with intermittent fasting sometimes too but i see that some people are fasting really long or days and days at a time and i think that's not going to be good in the long run either so um because we get asked a lot about that and you know i've done a lot of research into intermittent fasting and insulin resistance and it, and you know what we say is once a week uh from seven to seven perhaps you can you can avoid um eating that sort of thing um at 7 p.m to 7 a.m if you'd like to do that if you have a lot of weight to lose then that might be um something that you can try but if you're going 15 or 18 hours without eating i just can't see that that's going to be sustainable either in the long term. So, I know I've uh, I've um, had the most success with the intermittent fasting, like after dinner. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, in the morning. Um, it wasn't as easy for me when I was really insulin resistant. I mm-hmm. would wake up in the middle of the night. I think with really low blood sugar dips, um, and it would it would kind of wreak havoc on my sleep. But as I became more insulin sensitive. Um, I was able to to go longer periods of time without eating, but I, I and I think it's again all of these diets. It's it's not a one size fits all approach. You have to figure out what works best for your body. Definitely, and for someone who needs to lose like five or ten pounds or just manage their weight, you know, there's going to be different approaches that you could take. But you know, it's it's if there were one diet that was right for everybody, then you know that would that would be uh, something that. You know, there wouldn't be any other diets out there, I guess. But um, but I think we always emphasize whole foods and more, you know, vegetables and as much variety as we can do. And that's that's something that um, when we look at our patients that have high cholesterol with PCOS, we have to watch out for red, red meat a lot of times, like too much red meat. Um, and a lot of times we have endometriosis that's coexisting with PCOS. So we're really careful of that, um, trying to incorporate clean foods and organic foods. So just things like that, I think if we can go back to common sense, <laughs> I know it's not like, it's not um, super exciting to say these things, but it's just something that we need, we need to get back to. That's what, it, and we see it working time and time again, where the weight loss sustains, it doesn't come back, the weight gain. So that, that's the important thing. Uh, so I, I, I definitely want you to talk to us a little bit more about um, Chinese medicine and acupuncture and how that could help women with PCOS. Definitely. I mean, with uh, Chinese medicine, we do, like, when we talk about weight loss, we have patients who come in, it's interesting, for acupuncture for weight loss uh, and hormonal balance, but then they don't realize that they do have PCOS a lot of times. So we look at um, what can we do in Chinese medicine to help the spleen and, and the stomach, those are the channels involved a lot of times with our metabolism in Chinese medicine. And when we look at PCOS, we see a different different combination of usually blood stasis, which um, is in Chinese medicine considered to be something that can manifest as pain or blockage. And it could be in the lower abdomen a lot of times where there's pain when ovulation happens or when the period does come. It's cloudy and it's heavy, sometimes bleeding for many, many days and kind of dark, not bright red. So we use the period like our um, report card in Chinese medicine. So we're going to ask a lot of questions. And the first visit is going to be very detailed. I actually have people point to the color of their menstrual blood on the intake form because I want to make sure that we can actually use the right herbs as well and address them with the right points and that sort of thing. So um, so we use the period as another diagnostic tool along with the tongue and the pulse and also the I use the basal body temperature. And that can tell us a lot of things uh, according to Chinese medicine as well. We can see how the kidney function is. Our kidney energy is our reproductive energy in Chinese medicine. So we can see if the temperatures are always low, that could signify a kidney deficiency or we could have also, you can think of it like a thyroid issue too sometimes where uh, we're looking at it from both lenses. So I use a lot of integration in my practice. I like to look at lab work and I also look at the Chinese medicine portion as well of using the tongue and the pulse to diagnose the different types of patterns. And then um, we also look at everything we have available to us. And I think that's the beauty of 
practicing Chinese medicine in this age, um, we can look at all different aspects and then create a treatment plan that's customized for that particular patient instead of a one-size-fits-all treatment. So definitely um, there's foods that actually are beneficial in Chinese medicine for PCOS depending on you know, looking at if the spleen is not functioning as it should. And this doesn't mean the physiological spleen. It's basically the channel that runs down the body, and it's called the spleen channel. It actually originates at the toe, and it goes, uh, the, the large toe, and goes all the way through uh, into the reproductive system. So you have points that actually are going to be very beneficial for cycle regulation on that particular channel. You know, and then we look at... Uh, every week, we actually can do a different Chinese formula because uh, those herbs are going to be directed towards different functions. So the week of your period, we're going to be treating you a little differently than the week that you're ovulating. And so when we use a four-step process with the Chinese herbal formulas that we use, we use one called Blossom. Blossom is actually a four-stage formula that's going to be a different uh, formula for each week. So, the, so you have uh, the period phase. And the second week will be follicular. So it's helping with the follicular genesis and helping with, um, in general, you know, helping with egg quality over time. This, the third week is our ovulatory phase, hopefully, and the fourth week is the luteal phase. So those herbs are going to be different. Uh, they're acting differently according to what we, uh, where we are in our cycle. And if you have somebody who has never had a cycle on their own, that particular approach is so beneficial because they actually began to ovulate on their own with those herbs and, you know, with that treatment. So uh, it's, it's really helpful. It kind of brings the body back into balance without forcing it. And then that's, what I, that's the beauty of it. I, I really like um, having an approach that does not have side effects and that can actually work with your body instead of against it. Yeah, and, and to remind people that a pill bleed isn't really a period. And what right. you're here is to, to be able to um, you know, stimulate those hormones so that you can have a, a real period and ovulate, which is so important. And we had a little quick story about example of this is we had a patient who did never, she never ovulated on her own. She never had a period on her own. And she also had a, uh, problems with an eating disorder due to PCOS, which made her cycle even more, you know, non-existent. And she actually tried IVF and IVF didn't work. She didn't stimulate at all. And so she came to us after the IVF failed and I, and it was a very difficult case. And I actually referred her to another IVF doctor simultaneously. And I said, let's just see what we can do. And it, it's, it's going to take a little while to get in but we'll start working with herbs and acupuncture until you see this person. And so what it what happened was she got pregnant naturally. <laughs> so just using acupuncture and herbs, she was able to do that. And then it happened once again. So it was three months in. She actually had her appointment at the IVF center, and the doctor said, you're pregnant. Did you know that? <laughs> so, um, so then she came back after she had her baby. And again, we said, okay, let's just, I don't think this is going to happen. Again, that was probably a very uh, wonderful flute, but we'll, we'll do, do our same routine with the herbs and the acupuncture. And it happened again. Within three months, she was pregnant again. So I always joke that she really never still had a period with us. She had one period both times, you know, just one time uh, she had a period and then became pregnant. So I think that um, you can really do so many things. It's not that one system of medicine is perfect, but um, a lot of times where there's gaps in Western medicine, Eastern medicine can actually fill in those gaps and vice versa. What a great story. Um, you know, in the, the beginning part of the podcast, I was talking about how acupuncture really has helped me uh, with managing my stress um, and helping like support my adrenals. Uh, and and I, I know that it's uh, a wonderful modality for re um, helping with you know, IVF and um, reproduction. But can you tell us you know, some other ways that acupuncture helps your PCOS patients? I mean, what, the biggest shift I see is that it's a mental shift. It's basically um, the sympathetic nervous system calms and that they realize like, okay, I'm not running from a monster. This is, this is doable. I can handle my stress and my body 
can actually relax into this, the parasympathetic instead of always being in a sympathetic mode, a fight or flight response. So that tends to happen with acupuncture within a few treatments. And you know, we, we see it with, um, obviously we work a lot with IVF and we see patients who are trying to prepare for uh, a cycle, but we also see and, you know, that, that calming effect that happens when someone comes in for anxiety or depression. And we see this even in younger girls. Uh, so, you know, they're, they're all of a sudden, they're not as stressed anymore about the things that used to bother them. They're like, well, it's, it's still there, but it kind of slides off easier. So I don't know if you notice that with your treatment, but it's like, you're just not, it's not like you don't care, but you're just not as, uh, you know, freaked out about it anymore. So I think that, you know, it's a big uh, benefit to it. Yeah, I think uh, th- this last year has been tough for me because, um, you know, I've, if you can listen to my podcast, I think I've shared about my my son um, had a very scary diagnosis and had to have a have a, a really brutal surgery this past mm-hmm. summer. And, and I was stuck in that fight or flight response. Like I could not get myself out of it. And acupuncture has really helped me to kind of move into that rest and digest or the, the parasympathetic um, mm-hmm. state. And it, when everything else just wasn't working <laughs> for me, right. so, right. Uh, I see that. And, and I think it's, uh, a, like you said, a great tool for anxiety. And so many women with PCOS suffer from anxiety. Definitely. I'm glad that it helped you too. And, you're, and I, I feel like if more people knew about that, maybe they would be, you know, less, um, like, they would not be on medication so much um, because a lot of patients come in, they are on medications for depression and, you know, they're gaining weight also. And we know that it's, it's a hormonal issue a lot of times with PCOS. We don't think, and it's even been said by psychologists and psychiatrists, maybe antidepressants are not the first line of treatment you should think about for depression with PCOS. Obviously if it's very, very, you know, significant, then, you know, we've had patients come in who are suicidal with PCOS. Obviously, we're going to be working with a joint effort with their psychiatrist and with therapists and all kinds of intense programs. Um, but acupuncture can be added to that regimen. And I think eventually, with the help of, of the other practitioners, if that person wants to eventually come off of those medications, it's a great that's actually the reason why I studied it, it was right for, for drug addiction, but, um, but it can, I mean, I saw that what, how it was working for um, people who were addicted to heroin, coming off of heroin with acupuncture, I was amazed, and so that influence on the brain, there's something that helps the dopamine response, and, you know, helps with the neurotransmitters, and that really fascinates me about, <laughs> about this, this medicine, so. So for those listening that would like to try acupuncture but are afraid of the needles, kind of ease their mind. <laughs> oh, right. I mean, and so, yeah, that's the thing we get a lot of times. Um, the fear of needles is kind of ingrained in a lot of us. And so we, what we do say is that the needles that, ac- that most acupuncturists use, they're the size of your hair. They are mostly, for the most part, so thin that you can barely see them. So it's nothing like a hypodermic needle or injection. Um, it's basically they could probably fit inside a hypodermic needle. That's how tiny they are. So I think of it as it's really what what a lot of times we do is we offer a face down treatment the first time because no, you know you're not even looking at the needles. You're able to relax. We use a little bit of meditation, some lavender, kind of just ease into it a little bit. I think that um, also, you know, taking some deep breaths and knowing that it's nothing that you, it's probably way worse than you think it is. And um, the funny part is some people come in with tattoos and they're like, is this going to hurt? I'm like, believe me, you had a tattoo. There's no, no comparison. It's like a mosquito bite of anything, you know, or nothing at all, really. So um, definitely step out of your comfort zone a little bit. And, you know, I think that um, now we have the ABORM, which is, the American Board of Oriental Reproductive Medicine, you can go on their website. You can uh, type in your state or your country, and they have practitioners all over the world. So what we, we are, um, part of it myself, we're trained in reproductive medicine, uh, reproductive oriental medicine, and then also there's a, a test, an exam, actually, that covers 
uh, the integration of Eastern and Western medicine. So that's uh, something that if you do have a provider that's certified, that is going to, they're going to be speaking your language in other words. So they're going to know what PCOS is for sure, and they'll be able to help you. So that's a good resource um, to go to. Yeah, that's a great tip. And, and thank you for all of this um, information that you shared with us, as, you know, as, especially your story. Again, it was really inspirational. And thank you for the work that you're doing. You know, thank you. Uh, I would love for you to tell us more about your practice and um, how people can reach out to you, you know, if they want more information about Chinese medicine and acupuncture. Um, yeah, let us know how we can find you. Sure. Uh, we are at floridacompletewellness.com. And when you go to the site, you can actually book um, a consultation as well. We have phone consultations if you're in different, if you're not in the South Florida area. Uh, and we have um, some programs for PCOS as well, where we work with you a little more on hormonal balance and just, you know, achieving your goals with PCOS. Uh, and I think that um, in this day and age there's so many resources out there and sometimes it's, it gets confusing actually because there's too much information so we try to actually help simplify things a little bit and um and really help you on your on your path whatever your goal is well thank you so much dr Faraduro, for coming on the peace with Steve podcast and thank you everyone for listening today i look forward to being with you again very soon thank you amy bye Well, that wraps up our podcast today. Thank you so much for joining us on the PCOS Diva podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you liked this episode, remember to subscribe to PCOS Diva on iTunes or wherever else you may be listening to this show. And if you have a minute, please leave me a quick review on iTunes because I love to hear from you. If you think someone else might benefit from this free podcast, please take a minute to share it with a friend or family member so she can benefit from it too. And don't forget to sign up for my free weekly newsletter. Just enter your email at PCOSDiva.com to get instant access and make sure you never miss a future podcast. This is Amy Medling wishing you good health. Bye-bye.